Welcome back, everybody. Jonathan Welton here, and I have a special guest with me once again uh, today. This is uh, this is a real privilege and uh, a, a joy for me to be with an old friend, uh, Dr. Martin Trench, who many of you know through the the bestseller Victoria Eschatology. He co-authored together with Harold Everly. Uh, he is originally from Scotland and has pastored for 10 years in Alberta, Canada, and now he's back in the UK. I'm sure he'll share, you know, more of what he's up to, but he's authored several other books as well. And, and the topic today, we're going to get into um, the four spiritual diseases, and these are uh, deeply embedded in our, in our, even in our best new covenant churches, we still carry this stuff over. And so... Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be listening just along with you as well and interjecting questions here and there. But uh, I, I'm I'm privileged and so pleased to introduce my friend Martin. And uh, Martin, how about we dig into it? Let's hear uh, what's going on in your life and and what uh, what you want to share with us today. Well, I I'm really happy to be here with you. I'm really excited about the new ventures that you're getting involved in and uh, I'm just delighted to be a part of that. Um, yeah, I was in Canada actually for more than 10 years, over oh. 13 years. Oh. And so I wasn't, you were in upstate New York at the time. That's I wasn't right. very far away from you then. Um, but just over a year ago, I moved back to the UK. I'm in England now the north of England, Lancashire. Mm -hmm. That's where Wallace and Gromit comes from. That's probably uh -huh. the only reference that Americans will have. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> and um, I am the senior pastor of Crossgate Church UK, which is based in the city of Preston. And uh, so that's, where I, that's where, I, where I am just now. I've been here for a year. And... Um, I, I actually, I don't live in the city of Preston. I live just about 30 minutes away. I'm right on the beach. I've got the ocean here. So I've got some nice, which I didn't have in Alberta. It was a two day drive to the ocean. <laughs> so, um, it's, it, uh, it's good to be here. Um, yeah, the four spiritual diseases. This is, that's just a phrase that I came up with to, I find it easy. I find it easier to understand things if you can put a name on on it. If you can just name something, and um, and then uh, it helps you identify that issue in the future. And so, just to give you a little bit of background, I became a Christian when I was around eighteen years old. Um, it was during the charismatic renewal that was happening all over the world, including in the UK, in denominational churches, you know. Um, the, the man that led me to Christ was a Baptist pastor, spirit-filled Baptist pastor. So looking back and certainly looking at some of the fringe elements of the charismatic movement today, it, I would describe it probably, it was like middle-of-the-road charismatic, you know. Okay. It was the only charismatic we knew at the time, but yeah. probably it was middle of the road. You know, we were probably like evangelical Christians who had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, who sang worship songs, who lifted their hands and closed their eyes, spoke in tongues, believed in healing, that kind of thing. Um, at, but also there was a real move in the UK at the time because a lot of the Christians got ejected from their churches when they got spirit filled. So there was a real move at the time to people found themselves churchless and they had to just start churches. And since they didn't have a denominational constitution or bylaws anymore, they just went to the New Testament. And so we ended up with a uh, fivefold ministry the understanding of apostles and prophets, um, apostolic teams, all of that kind of thing. I remember, I remember years ago, Peter Wagner, when he first started really promoting the apostolic ministry and 
new apostolic reformation and that kind of thing. I remember back then, this won't be the case now, but back then he said the UK churches are at least a decade ahead of the US churches on church government issues. But that was probably because like back in the 80, I, I became a Christian in 1984. Um, George Orwell, that's why I remember the the the, the day of the year. And, uh, um, but that had been going on for probably 10 years at that point, this establishing of apostles, recognizing that certain people were apostles, some were prophets, apostolic teams, networks of churches with local pastors, some of the networks called them elders, but elders and pastors are the same office in the New Testament and um, and so on. So he, he reckoned they were 10 years ahead. Now, the difference is there's a lot more Christians in the U.S. than there, is, than there are in the U.K., percentage-wise, as well as numbers-wise. And churches tend to be much bigger in the U.S. than in the U.K. So probably that did not get the airtime in the global Christian market. But that was his take at the time. So I came in, middle of the road, evangelical, middle of the road, charismatic, but yeah, understanding that let's base our churches on New Testament principles, you know? Yeah. And um, then as, as the years, but you know, I did a degree in theology and so on, I became the assistant pastor in a word of faith church. Hmm. It was actually a plan from a Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Rama graduates. And so I really came, so I really then was part of the word of faith movement for quite a number of years. Now, I got so much out of that. I'm about to critique it. So I want to say, first of all, <laughs> I got so much out of that. Like, yeah, the Bible became a living book to me, you know. Um, faith became real, you know. Faith could move mountains. Prayer can change things. Uh, life should progress. Your faith should progress. Uh, you can believe for better, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it was really impacting to me. And... I had a bit of a, you know, I was quite strong in those days on the healing ministry, word of knowledge and healing ministry. And that coupled with teaching, faith teaching on healing, T.L. Osborne, healing the sick, all of that kind of stuff gave me, I had such, I'm so grateful for that. I had such a strong foundation. Yeah. However, there were, there are certain things that, are like added baggage in a lot of the word of faith stuff. One of them is, and I never understood this really, but word of faith people tend to believe in the rapture, the tribulation, the whole, you know, I, most of the main word of faith preachers would hold to that view. And it doesn't seem to fit with the victorious Christian life message that they're preaching. Yeah. And I all now I, I know why. I know because a lot of them came out of like assemblies of God and Pentecostal background and they brought that belief with them, you know? Yeah, makes sense. But but the two things never really gelled. Yeah. And um the other thing that I noticed was it is very easy in word of faith churches to get into legalism, you know. Um mm. What's your words? What's your confession? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it's like it becomes a very tight and narrow path that you're walking, you know, and uh, it can become really legalistic. That's not what the word says, brother, and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. And also very literalistic, very literalistic. So if we're taking because we're taking this, the word of God seriously, it was a tendency to overly literalize even things that that were quite clearly metaphors in scripture. I mean, I often heard preachers try to prove a point. Maybe the point was that healing is for all or healing is in the atonement or something like that or on prosperity. 
And they would try to prove that point using a passage that quite clearly was not talking about physical healing or the word prosper in there was not talking. And I would think there are plenty of other passages you could go to. Like, why are you overly literalizing a vague, vague passage, you know? But anyway, I bought into the whole thing, heart and soul, because it really, it really impacted me. Kenneth Hagin's books really impacted me. Yeah. In fact, he was the first person that I heard using the term better covenant. He had a little mini book called yeah. a better covenant. It's, it's somewhere behind me. I, yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, from Hebrews, a new and better covenant. And so, uh, so there was a lot of great stuff, a lot of real faith building stuff, a lot of uh, stuff that helps you to be optimistic, a lot of optimistic Christianity. Mm, Yet yeah. there was also this pessimistic end time view. And there was this tendency to legalism and tendency to like make passages in the Bible say things that they're not, they don't say. Mm -hmm. Even if the doctrine you're teaching is true, it's not taught in that passage, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And yeah. so um, now I think because I had theological training, I had a degree by this time. I had been to Bible college for three years. It was a famous one in Scotland. It was called the Bible Training Institute. It was founded by D.L. Moody. So it had a long history. When he came and had a revival there and founded this college, you see. And so people from all denominations were there. We got taught like all the views of the atonement, all the views of the book of Revelation. There was not one specific. The professors might have had a particular view, but they would teach a wide range of theology, you know. Got taught quite a lot of Reformed theology as well there too. Um, and so, uh, so I was aware that some things didn't fit. Um, then when I went on, I, was, I, I then left that church after a number of years and, and was sent out to plant a church. So I planted a church with no team. It was just me, right? I played the guitar. Um, then I put it down and I took up the offering. <laughs> then I picked up my Bible and I preached and then I laid hands on everybody. At the, at the end. I was not, that's not how you plan a church. Uh -huh. oh, anyway, uh -huh. That was what I did. And somehow or other, God blessed it. I mean, like people were healed, miracles happened, and people started to come. And God blessed it. We leased an old abandoned nightclub, did, did the whole thing up. We had, everybody was still using overhead projectors with the acetate slides in those days. We purchased a big projector that looked like a cannon, you know, and ah. um, somebody, PowerPoint wasn't out, somebody designed on a gaming computer, designed some software to put the words of the songs up on the screen and all <laughs> of that kind of stuff. And it kind of became a bit of a conference center as well as a church. We had a restaurant. We had guest speakers would come from all John Avancini and all of these mm. uh, people would come and they would speak um, in our church. Andrew Womack, before he was famous, you know. Wow. Um, so we would have all these people come and speak in our church. And uh, on Sundays, man, the Holy Spirit was moving. And we were probably on the wild end of the charismatic movement at that point. Yeah. And like what, what we time, what time period are we talking about? Oh, this is the 90s. Let me think. Goodness, late, maybe late 90s. Okay. So Mid this is after Brownsville and Toronto had broken out. Oh, right. So let me think. Yeah, so this all started before Browns, be, certainly before Toronto. It's happened before Toronto um, because I remember what happened. What I had before people had heard of Rodney Howard Brown, even. Yeah. A friend of mine from Alaska, she called me and said, 
I've got a friend called Rodney Howard Brown. He's speaking in Aberdeen, which was like hours away from where we lived. And he's only there for one night. You need to go and meet him. Uh So I drove all the way up to Aberdeen. Um, He laid hands on me. Uh, Like I couldn't speak. I could only speak in tongues. I couldn't speak in English the whole night. Wow. And he loaded me up with all of his cassette tapes. It was cassette tapes in those days. Yeah. (laughs) So I drove home, hours home, listening to them. It was a Saturday night. And I, so my church had never seen this. Nobody had seen it. And mm-hmm. I got up in the Sunday morning to speak. And while I'm speaking, everyone starts laughing and sliding off their chairs on the floor. You know? Uh-huh. And I'm like, I thought my fly was undone. And they were all laughing. <laughs> I actually, I turned around and checked. <laughs> And then within a very short time, within a few months, uh, both Rodney and Toronto became a phenomenon. We heard about it. And yeah, I, vis- I visited Toronto along with everybody else. And, yeah. and so so it started before, okay. maybe a couple of years before all of that. Then we even had teams from Toronto. Rodney used, uh, one of Rodney's evangelists, Richard Moore, who I'm good friends with, he's based mm-hmm. in Florida. He used to come over regularly and so on. Oh. And um, so, anyway, the church has grown. People are getting saved. People are being healed. Christians are being attracted from other churches because we were a Sunday night church. Our service was at 6 p.m. because we had lots of young people. They sleep in on Sundays, you know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, sometimes even up pastors would bring their congregation of smaller churches and yeah. so on. Uh, but while all of this good stuff, oh, deliverance, we were huge on deliverance and spiritual warfare. Okay. Um, like we were big on the spiritual mapping and principalities and powers and all of that. Uh-huh. And also, uh, like there were demons cast out all the time, you know, and let everyone who had a demoniac in their family brought them to us. We became like the deliverance center, you know. And what, our, what that, was that um, uh, coming from Peter Wagner's influence? Oh, no, not really. That was probably coming from, I did, a, I used to visit Nigeria once a year. I, I, had, I had a real spiritual father there, Victor yeah. O'Neill, who was like the apostle over a whole network of churches victory Mm. christian mission he's dead now but um he was a good friend of mine he used he used to visit us he used to invite me once a year to speak at his conference at victory cathedral for a week and then he would take me for another week out to a village or something Mm. and boy we saw crazy stuff you know and so i learned all the deliverance there and then came back and it, it became a big thing now, while all of this stuff was going on, I began to become concerned about bad fruit that I was also seeing, mm. right? So one of the things was the whole end times thing. And this obsession with, I mean, people were beginning to panic about Y2K and things like that, you know, yeah. in the late 90s. and. And there was this obsession with the end times and and uh, everything was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and, you know, and um, so there was all, all of that stuff. And I could see that it did not really, it wasn't really bearing good fruit in people's lives. In fact, there was a lot of fear that was associated with it, you know? Yeah. Then another thing was, all of this deliverance, which like for the first few years that I was into it, like I was, I was into it, yeah. you know? I mean, like I remember one woman started levitating off the floor and we had to, to have two people sit on her, you know, to hold her yeah. down. And it was like, well, this is real. So we, we really need to get our sleeves rolled up and get on. But I noticed that um, it was almost becoming like the, the devil and demons were taking such a predominant place 
in yeah. ministry. And I began, and, and also the people who were getting delivered were like six months later, they were demonized again, you know? Right. And they needed to get delivered all over again. Yeah. Um, even, even like the move of the spirit with holy laughter and all of that kind of stuff, I noticed that some people were becoming addicted to it. Mm. And that was the answer to all their problems. Yeah. Was that, you know, I, I remember this couple that had constant marriage problems. It turned out later on that they were based on the fact that the guy had a gam online gambling addiction and was running up all these debts. But they never told me that. Uh, mm -hmm. All I knew was they were fighting all the time, this young couple. And their answer to that was to come to a glory meeting and get into the glory and get slain in the spirit and lie there for an hour. And then after that, they were madly in love with each other for two more weeks, you know? And yeah. then there were other problems and then they would need to get, have be touched by the glory, all over, you know, that, that yeah. was the kind of thing. Yeah. And then, of course, the legalism bothered me. It began to bother me. I personally was getting free of legalism. And so now I became aware of how legalistic um, and judgmental, the judgmentalism. Can you give an example of the legalism that you would have gotten out of or that you are observing? Okay, so it's, so for instance, in the UK, it is perfectly normal for Christians to drink beer or wine. Perfectly yeah. normal, acceptable. Yeah. But you go to a Christian conference and there might be a bar in the conference center. And after the, after you've all been touched by the Holy Spirit, that you then go in for a, another spirit, you know, gin and tonic or something like that. Right? <laughs> and yeah. talk, talk about how great the, 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 the service was. But in Word of Faith circles, that was not the case. The, that whole American thing was imported with it. Okay. So I, I, I went... I went anti-alcohol like for a long time um, because I was part of that that scene. Um, and so then you would, but then what happens is, no, no, hey, there are some people who should not drink alcohol. They just should not do it. <laughs> yeah, because five-year-olds, 10-year-olds. Yeah, <laughs> people with addictive <laughs> personalities. <laughs> so, um, but... Uh, everything with legalism, everything is a blanket statement upon everybody. And then there were certain teachings like, so I remember, a I, I don't want to name the preachers because I, I still yeah. hold them in honour, but yeah. famous faith preacher who said that the Lord told them that they were to preach this message that everyone was to pray. If everyone, if you prayed in tongues for an hour every day, you would see your life change. Mm, yeah. Now, that was on the back of, there had already been a message gone through the whole movement of, could you not tarry one hour? That's what I was thinking, the famous book. Yeah. So you were, to, you were to pray for an hour a day, and it was to be based on the Lord's Prayer. Now you were to pray in tongues for an hour a day on top of that. Uh -huh. And then you were to do all your scripture affirmations, which would take about another half hour. You go through all the booklets that were going about for the scripture affirmations. And then, of course, you were to be a student and study to show yourself approved unto God. Yeah. It was a full time job being a Christian. <laughs> you know, and it was like no one can live up to this. And you can't even drink with all that. That's... And you can't even drink. <laughs> and after all these hours of doing that, all you wanted was a <laughs> stiff whiskey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so um wow. I, I realized that there was a lot of ju judginess judgmentalism yeah it was bad fruit uh, i remember there was one woman in particular who it, it just struck me that this woman was the most enthusiastic worshiper in the church Oh, she loved Jesus. Oh, and she was an enthusiastic worshiper, but she hated everybody else. <laughs> Boy, she was nasty. She was judgmental. She would snap at people. 
And it's like that verse where it says, out of the same mouth, you praise God and you curse your brother. Yeah. You know, my brethren, this should not be, you know, in the book of James. And I thought, there's something not right about this. And so I did a whole, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an, an introspective thinker. I don't know if everybody is. I kind of think everybody should be, but maybe they're not. But I, I am, right? I do a lot of kind of introspective, contemplative thinking yeah. and checking my own heart and what's wrong, you know, why does this issue keep cropping up in my life? What What is it that I'm doing that's making this happen? Because one of the things I noticed that was very common in the Word of Faith movement was everything was the fault of an, an outside source. It could be the devil. It could be, but whatever it was, you had to bind something. You had to pray for it to change. Um, you're not getting on with your children. You've got to pray for them that God will change them and so on. And but I'm a I'm I'm a big believer in that you attract into your life and you are attracted to what is going on internally, you know. And so. I began to realize that I was judgmental, I was legalistic, that the end time views that I'd kind of come to accept, even though I knew there were other views, um, were was not compatible with the rest of the message. Grace, I began to get a revelation of grace. Uh, so it wasn't just faith now, it's faith and grace. Because faith without grace can be legalistic, you know? Yeah. Grace without faith can be very victim oriented. Oh, there's nothing I can do, but God, my life is a, a pile of garbage, but at least Jesus loves me through it all, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and so I was realizing the importance of faith and grace. Mm -hmm. And and you know, when you change, that's when you start to notice things, especially as a pastor of a church. You're, you're seeing a whole bunch of people and you're watching their spiritual journey, not just your own. Yeah. So I, eventually I came to the point that I thought there are four spiritual diseases. That's just a term I came up with. Yeah. And I call them diseases because I think they're infectious. Mm. And they are part of the body of Christ. They show up in slightly different ways in different streams of the body of Christ, but they're present throughout. So for instance, in the reformed churches, they might take one particular free, you know, style. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, is the charismatic movement full of these four spiritual diseases. Even those who call themselves New Covenant or would say they were Better Covenant or they're Kingdom people or Seven Mountains or whatever, whatever. Yeah. It's yeah. full of it, like riddled with it. And I think when you hold contradictory beliefs inside, it, it, it is so entangling. It stops, it, it stops you being free to pursue the things you want to pursue and become the person you want to become because there's a contradictory belief there, you know? Mm -hmm. So people will say they're, they're, they believe in grace, new covenant grace, and yet they'll still hold to these. And so here, here, are, here are the four diseases. They are futurism. So futurism is basically reading the prophetic passages in the Bible, ignoring the last 2,000 years of church history, and pushing all of those prophecies off to the future. Yeah. Right? So they're all pushed off to the future. And it's always our near future. That's right. Right? So they're all pushed off to the future. So the Great Tribulation, well, that's in our future even though Jesus clearly said this generation will not pass away before that came to pass. And it's easy. And, and like, and of course we know uh, that in the Roman Jewish war from 66 to 70 AD, everything Jesus predicted about a time of great tribulation happened 
exactly the way he predicted it. And in fact, Jesus didn't say it was a worldwide tribulation. He said it was going to be in Judea. Yeah. Let, so let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And we know from history that the Christians did that. I mean, like we know that everything was fulfilled, right? But no, we're going to completely ignore that. We're going to ignore the fact that all of the our heroes of the faith, from Charles Spurgeon to John Wesley, believed that the Great Tribulation was fulfilled within one generation in the Jewish Roman War. We're going to ignore all of that, and we're going to push it off to our near future. Now, actually, full preterism does the same. It takes all of the prophecies and it pushes them into our past. Mm. Even like a final return of Christ, a final judgment, that kind of thing, pushes them all up into the past. Now, here's the problem. When you decide that all, uh, uh, and then historicists will take all of the prophecies and try and stretch them out over history. But then, but they try to stretch them out up until the day they live in. Right. So if you, read a, if you read a book from a, an historicist from like uh, 200 years ago, they've stretched them out a certain way, but one today has to stretch them out a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the problem. Although <clears throat> regarded as a partial preterist, basically what used to be a preterist before full preterism came along, but a partial preterist, I don't even like that label very much. What I want to regard myself as an in-context person. So, mm -hmm. because I think when you buy into a system first, you then, when you read the Bible, you have to make everything fit into your preconceived system. Mm -hmm. So if you're a futurist, you have to push all of these prophecies. So the mark of the beast, you know, it's easy to show from history that was to do with Nero and the Agora, the marketplace and all of that kind of stuff. But you have to, but if you've already bought into futurism, you have to ignore all of that and you have to push it off into the future. And it's the World Economic Forum and or whatever it is. Right. And so you do that. And um, uh, so you basically you've basically tied yourself in knots before you even start reading the Bible. And so when I, when I read a, now, when I read a prophetic passage in the Bible, whether it be an apocalyptic one like Revelation or Daniel or whatever, or whether it be a clear prophetic, maybe Jesus in Matthew 24 or something like that, I'll read that. I'll say, okay, what's the context here? Is this talking about something that was going to happen in a few years' time? Is it talking about something that was going to happen in a long time? Um, I mean, even Jesus talks about, and the master was delayed in his coming. Okay, there's a delay here. Let's take that. And so, um, and let's take that passage in context. Let's not decide it's already been fulfilled or it's going to be fulfilled. Let's find out what it actually says in context. And let's take each of the passages in their context. Okay. So futurism, fear, it was producing fear speculation, wild speculation, all kinds of science fiction type scenarios that were now part of people's faith. And I was getting turned off by this. And I decided to, on my own, do a full research of uh, Bible prophecy. Now, in, in that time period, we're talking 90s. So was the fear around Y2K? Was that what was coming up? Yeah, yeah, I think most of it was to do with Y2K. Okay. Yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of other stuff as well. There was to do with, um, I remember a big thing was fisheye lenses on computers and s smart TVs were beginning to be talked about. Okay. In the future, TVs will be able to watch you as well as you watching them and all, and this was somehow to do with the end times and all and of that. We'll be recording everything you say. I, thankfully, that never happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, like, there are things to be concerned. I am concerned about the World Economic Forum, uh, and yeah. digital passport and things like that. I'm concerned about it because it's contrary to freedom, not because it's predicted in the book of Revelation. Well said. 100% yeah. agree.
yeah. So, um, so I, I did. A, I actually took two years. I didn't speak about Bible prophecy for two years, and I did two years, and I read lots of stuff. Um, I think the guy that convinced me the most was J. Marcellus Kick, ah. and his an eschatology of victory. Yes. And it was like because it was a verse by verse exegetical type thing. And like I could not fault what he was saying. Um, and then I was helped a lot by David Chilton and all of that kind of stuff too. Mm. And um, and so eventually I thought, okay, I don't need to worry about the next video I see that Obama is the Antichrist because Jesus. I don't know if you remember this. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And although that was written in Greek, and if you translated it into Hebrew, it sounds like Barack Obama or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I remember when uh, Gorbachev was the Antichrist because he had a mark on his head. I remember when Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. I remember a book came out about how he was go Saddam Hussein was going to restore Babylon right. and all of that kind of stuff. And then I thought, I don't need, I can dismiss all of that. It was all wrong anyway. I can dismiss all of that and I don't need to worry about what the next one is because now I have come to a conclusion yeah. about what the mark of the beast was and that Nero was the great beast and that, and yes. Yes, we can learn lessons from that. That doesn't mean the book of Revelation is not applicable to our life. I mean, Paul wrote a letter to a literal church in Galatia in the first century, but it's still applicable to our life yes. today, right? Yeah. And so, um, anyway, the, then there was the whole, I told you about the whole demons and deliverance and principalities and all of that stuff, spiritual warfare, and and I, I eventually realized that this was not producing good fruit. Mm. It was producing spectacular, sensational manifestations. Mm. It was creating the illusion that something was happening, but I wasn't seeing good fruit in people's lives. And I was coming to the conclusion that mm, people need to be taught some principles for living stable, emotionally stable lives. Yeah. You know? And if you do have demons because you're you're out hooking up with total strangers every Friday night, casting the demons out of you is not going to stop you hooking up with total strangers. It's hooking up with total strangers that's going to stop you picking up demons. <laughs> you know, it was <laughs> like putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. Kenneth Hagen again really helped me with this with his book, The Triumphant Church. Mm -hmm. He said, Look, if you bind all the principalities and powers over a city, that's not going to get everybody saved. But if you get everybody saved, you have just uprooted the principalities and powers over the city. I thought, Wow, that, like, that makes so much sense. Uh -huh. You know? Wow. And um, and so I realized that we needed to stop driving out the darkness and instead shine a brighter light. Mm. You know? And so the entrance of your word brings light. If we could teach liberating truths from scripture, the entrance of that word would bring light and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Right. Yeah. And so. I began to shift away from this emphasis on deliverance and spiritual warfare. <clears throat> I would say today that this is, some people might not like this. You Maybe this will sound like I've gone too extreme, but it makes me happy, okay? So um, today, this is what I would say. Most of the time, I live my life as if the devil doesn't exist. Mm. I Now, there are times that I feel that I might be under a spiritual attack. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I will go back to acknowledging, right, I'm under a spiritual attack here. I'm being bombarded by the enemy. 
I don't know if someone's putting a curse on me. I don't know if I've opened the door. I don't know what it may be, but I do feel under a spiritual attack and I will stand strong in faith. I will stand against the enemy. I will draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from me, right? I will, you know, I have the full armor of God. I've got the shield of faith. I'm going to renew my mind and put on that helmet of salvation and so on. But so if I feel like I'm under an attack, I will deal with it. But apart from that, most of the time I live my life as if the devil doesn't exist because actually for me, he doesn't because Jesus Christ did spoil the devil, stripped principalities and powers. He delivered me out of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of light. Right. And um, yeah. if I feel under an attack, the best place to be is to run and hide myself in Christ. Mm. I run to the rock that is higher than I. You are my hiding place. You surround me with songs of deliverance, it says in Psalms. Mm. And so instead of being a warrior for Jesus and going and fighting the devil, I'm going to get myself in the presence of God. I'm going to hide myself in Christ. I'm going to put myself in the, in the rock of my salvation. The Lord is my fortress. Yeah. I'm going to stop focusing, even under an attack. I'm not going to focus on the attack. I'm going to focus on the light and on the Lord and get in him. And yeah, it, brings, it brings kind of two things to mind as you're sharing. Like Jesus, when he's tempted by the devil in the wilderness, it says at the end that he left him to look for a more opportune time. And mm -hmm. the opportune time is Kairos. It's a specific strategic moment. It's not that he was Kronos. Uh, attacking him every day all day long but yeah. he looked at times and like you're saying most of life you you're advancing the kingdom moving forward living life in relationship but you're not you know there are seasons where that opportune time he shows up to fight and then on the other side I, I kind of think of like like I don't focus on cancer all the time mm -hmm. but if I eat right and I exercise and I take care of myself I don't have to think about that now, if it ever showed up, okay, then you I'll, deal with it. I'll yeah. deal with it. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm not focused on cancer all the time. Or, you know, or, yeah. I think the biggest spiritual warfare is in here. Yes. You know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and taking every thought captive. Yes. And, you know, Jesus said, before he was arrested, he said to his disciples, the evil one comes, but he has nothing in me. Yeah. Now, the evil one comes and he's got a whole bunch of things in us. Sure. Yeah. So it, the best spiritual warfare is for us to deal with our unresolved inner issues so that he has nothing in us. So there's no buttons that can be pushed and no strings that can be pulled. And I'll take us down a rabbit trail for a moment, or maybe a rabbit hole, but the, you know, even the systems around us, it's not just as an individual, but whether it's the food, the pharmaceutical, the government, the communism, like all that stuff, all of those are thought systems that are strongholds that we have to take captive, that mm -hmm. to step out of those systems to live right. in the kingdom of freedom and light and, and the kingdom and all that, it's in opposition to the those evil systems that are created around us. Let, let me just share with you a little funny anecdote. Sometimes it is the things that we are frustrated with that actually God can be using to get our attention, that there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And during this season, there was a church in the same town as us, and it, they didn't do any spiritual warfare. They never talked about the devil. They, um, and they were growing so much faster than we were. And it used to really irritate me. Yeah. Because I would think we're, we're so much more spiritually aware than they are. And we're the ones that are binding the enemy and all that. And there was also another church. I knew, I knew both pastors. There was another church. And they were huge. They were even bigger than us on spiritual warfare. They were all, in fact, a lot of their worship songs were um, about principalities and powers. Uh, 
stand down principalities, powers of darkness flee. I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord because I've got the victory. That was one of the songs they sang all the time, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so they were really big and boy, they were struggling. They, uh, that church was struggling big time. And yeah. I know they thought they were even more spiritually aware than we were, you yeah. know? And this is what I noticed. See, the more you focus on the enemy and the more you focus on darkness and the more you talk about spiritual attacks, the more of it you seem to attract into your life. It's like what you focus on, you you, you go to, there, there's a, in the TV show Frasier, there's a scene where Frasier, he's never ridden a bike and he's learned to ride a bicycle. Mm. And he's scared he's going to crash into, I don't know, what it is like a lamp post or a, a post box or something like that. And because he can't keep his mind off it, he keeps going towards it. Right. And it, you know? Yeah. And um, there's a I've real heard, thing. Yeah. I've heard that with race car drivers that if they look at the wall, they're going to crash. And it's yeah. like, you can't, you can't focus on that. Yeah. I think it was actually Derek Prince who had a, a metaphor about, a giant pile of garbage in the back room of your house that if you were constantly just focused on chasing the rats away, it's never ending. But if you actually right. clear out the pile of garbage, you're not going to have a rat problem. Yeah. And I mean, Or an open so wound. If you've got an open wound and there's flies coming and you're casting the flies out all the time, maybe, <laughs> maybe the wound needs healed and the flies won't come to it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so... Now, so, is this one of, is spiritual warfare and deliverance one of the Well, four? dualism is, dualism. dualism. Ah, okay. So dualism is when you, right, so we've got male and female. You know, when, when you read the Genesis account, everything is binary. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> but everything is binary. <laughs> Go there's, for it, Mike. there's the heavens and the earth. I mean, the, the seven days of creation are actually not really the seven days of creation. They're the seven days of order. Mm. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when we get to day one, day two, God is setting things in order. There's the heavens and the earth. There's the land and the sea. There's the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. There's the sun and the moon. There's day and night. There's male and female. Now, having two things is not dualism. Mm. But making two things in opposition to each other is. So like day and night together make up one 24-hour day. Okay? They are two halves of the one. Male and female are supposed to harmoniously be one. For this reason, in that account, it says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one, right? Mm -hmm. However, when men are misogynistic and women are into, like, third-wave feminism, they see each other as the enemy, they fight each other, and they something that is supposed to be a harmonious whole becomes dualistic, right? Now, so dualism is when in the spiritual warfare context, I mean, what one aspect of dualism is when people think that your spirit is pure, but your body is evil. Yeah, yeah. Right? People mix up the word body with the word flesh. They think yeah. when the Bible talks about the flesh, it's two different words. The word for body is soma. The word for flesh is sarx. And sarx doesn't actually mean the body. It means nature, your nature. Yeah. Right? So a, a dog has a canine nature. A cat has a feline nature. A cow has a bovine nature. A man has a human nature. Mm. It's talking about our flesh. It's talking about our human nature, right? And the tendencies of the human nature. But if people make the spirit good and the body bad, that is a form of dualism. Yeah. But in this context, I'm talking about when Christians live as if the devil and demons, and if they're into futurism, the coming Antichrist, yeah. just as powerful as God. 
It's mm. like there's this eternal battle, as if the battle has not already been won. Mm. Right? But the battle's already been won. Jesus won the battle. Um, but dualism sees the enemy as this very powerful thing. You see that meme going about of Jesus and Satan arm wrestling each other. Have you seen that one? Right, They're yeah. In their arm, no, that I'm no, that's not happening. Now, um, I I actually saw this. I began looking at Christian art through the ages, and you know, a common picture in say Catholic churches is of Michael the archangel from Book of Revelation fighting the dragon, right? Mm. And they're like these. In some of them, Satan is bigger than Michael. Yeah. But if you go back a couple of hundred years, Satan and Michael are the same size. And then if you go back a couple of hundred years before that, Michael's much bigger than Satan. And then the earliest painting I could find, Satan was actually a little gnat with wings. <laughs> and Michael was swatting him away with a sword. Wow. wow. And it's like, Satan has got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Wow. I mean, somebody's yeah. been someone's been feeding this dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and making him bigger and bigger, feeding him our fears and our belief in his power. Yeah. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So if I've got faith that Satan cannot touch me, then that will be done unto me. Satan cannot touch me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, dualism. which is what I mean. The Apostle John said that. I think it's First John five five somewhere in that neighborhood. He said, "The devil cannot touch me." That's right. That's Literally. right. Literally. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then, of course, legalism. Legalism is a big part of that, and legalism let's, plays. Let's, into let's pause for a moment. Let's pause for a moment because I want to dig a little further on dualism. Uh, you touched on something that I think would be intriguing to hear your thoughts, especially in response to all the universalism out there right now. Right. These Christians that are saying, well, I don't believe in dualism and that we were ever separated from God. It was just in our head. We were never alienated. We were never dead. We were never, you know, that, that basically everybody's already saved, but they just don't know it until they come to a revelation of it. And that that concept, which because dualism is usually what they attack because they've been listening to a lot of Eastern thinking. And right. so bring bring your thoughts on that. OK, so. Um, yeah, it's interesting when people. So I am not saying this. I, I said I'm an introspective thinker. Right. I try not to talk about things that I don't know very much about. Okay. Yeah. So if I talk about something, if I publicly talk about something like here, it means I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of reading, mm -hmm. probably over a few years, right? Yeah. yeah. So I've spent time looking at the whole universalism thing. I've read all the books. I've read the famous books. Yeah. From from like a couple of hundred years ago. The ones that they would quote, uh, universalism, the prevailing doctrine of the Christian church for the first 500 years. I've read that book, you know, I've, I've, uh, I, so I've read all of that stuff. I think that Oregon was probably the church's greatest early theologian. Mm. He wasn't exactly a universalist, but he can be quoted to sound like one, right? And I've mm. read all of his stuff too. I think he was one of the greatest uh, theologians, but he differentiated, and a lot of the early church did, they differentiated two things, revealed theology and speculative theology. Mm. And so they would say revealed theology are those things that are clearly revealed in scripture. Speculative theology is when the Bible doesn't teach, doesn't say anything about a particular subject, so you're free to speculate on it as long as your speculations do not contradict something that the Bible does clearly. So, for instance, Oregon speculated that there are many other worlds. 
that God has created. And maybe when we go to heaven and we spend time with God, we might be able to then go to one of those worlds and visit them. Similar to, like, people, I've heard near-death experience stories where people have said very similar things, mm. right? But he would say that's a speculation, mm. right? That's a speculation. That is not revealed theology. Yeah. Um, so the universalism thing, this is what I've noticed. When people buy into it, within a very short time, they have jettisoned almost every other teaching of the Christian faith, including the gospel. Yeah. Even if they start off holding to the gospel and saying, no, we still want people to be saved because one form of universalism would be ultimate reconciliation would be because unsaved people will still go to hell. They just won't go there for all eternity and eventually they will get out and go to heaven. And we don't right. want people we don't want people to go to hell at all, so we still want to preach the gospel. And get yeah, give it six months, and you won't even be preaching the gospel anymore. You know, and um, and so I mean, I've seen the same actually with the churches that embrace the LGBT stuff. Yeah, within a very short period of time, they no longer believe the Bible is the word of God. They don't believe that people need to be saved. They. Um, one guy told me, people don't need to be saved. They need to be loved just the way they are, you know, and that, is, that was now the gospel, you yeah. know. And so, um, yeah, so they, they would say we're rejecting dualism. And, yes, they are rejecting dualism, but you can reject so it's like eternal conscious torment. You might have heard eternal conscious torment preached and it is so horrible in the way it's presented that you you, you think you, the only answer is to become a universalist. Okay. Right? It's like saying, um, so people are saying, I've heard people say uh, penal substitutionary atonement. I've heard that preached and I've heard it preached in a really distasteful way Therefore, and I've heard people say this, therefore, they reject all atonement theories and they say Jesus didn't have to die for our sins to be forgiven. God loved us before Jesus died and would have forgiven us anyway. His death was just an example of sacrificial love. Well, now, uh, yeah, yeah, there's now a you've rejected famous... all atonement. Yeah, there's a famous uh, author from what was the emergent church movement uh, you, like 15 years ago that talked, he wrote in his book that um, even if Jesus wasn't resurrected, even if he was buried in a shallow grave and picked apart by wild dogs, dogs. That, that, you know, it doesn't matter because, and it was essentially what you're saying, like, it was yeah. just a demonstration of God's love for us, like, yeah wow <laughs> like i yeah i can't but it, you're right there's something and, and we see the warnings in scripture over and over again of doctrines of demons mm -hmm. and that that there's delusions and that there's false teaching there's you know stay away from these things because you don't want to walk away from the faith and we yeah. we just we don't hear that especially i think in the very charismatic apostolic church kingdom movement the mm -hmm. warning those those are important warnings to remind people of and we yeah. we, we don't often but so i i said about faith and grace and if you've just got faith and no grace you can be legalistic but if you've just got grace you can be so wishy-washy that it's like what well, you know whatever believe whatever yeah. you want live whatever way you want and you're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's right. So. I know that. And um, I mean, like, if I'm in a worship service and we're singing songs about, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. It has, man, those, I, I get choked up. Mm. But he died on the cross for me that I could be, the simple gospel still gets me. Yeah. If the simple gospel message that Jesus died for you, that he shed his blood for you so that you could be washed clean 
and you could be saved and you could be reconciled to the Father. If yeah. that doesn't still make you choke up at times, then I'm sorry, you've slipped too far from me. You well know? said. That's a, that's a simple way to put it. It's a good test. Um, so we've we've talked about futurism, we've talked about legalism, we're talking about dualism now. And if we were to give, um, you know, a, a broad sweeping statement for dualism, a lot of it would be uh, the battle between us and the flesh, us and the world, us and our humanity, us and the demonic. You're of basically course. everything is everything is in a fight. Yes, it's that's right. That's right. We should be. We are living on this side of the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, the outpouring of the spirit. We're living on this side of it. Okay. We're living on this side of the fall of Jerusalem. Yeah. We're living on this side of the end of the age. Uh, yeah. The earth is the Lord's. It's not the devil's. People talk about, well, the devil's the God of this world. Well, no, he's not. Um, that verse actually says the God of this age. But then uh, the Bible also tells us that this age was coming to an end. And it did come to an end. And we're no longer under the old covenant age any yeah. longer. We're under a new and better covenant. The time of the, the, the New Testament was written was a bit of a mixed covenant because the new covenant had been birthed and they were preaching the new covenant, but the old covenant age still had a generation to yeah. die out. Yeah. But it did die out. The elements were destroyed. I mean, the temple's gone. The priesthood's gone. Sometimes people will say today, uh, oh, Anybody, any Jew with the name Cohen is a, dis, is a priest. And then when the temple's rebuilt, they will be pre No, the genealogical records were burned. They were destroyed. Yeah. No Jew today knows what tribe they descended from. Um, there are no sacrifices. It's, it's done. There's no law code. Yeah. The law is now written on our heart. Yeah. Oh, well, you're giving people a license to sin. No, I'm not. If someone is truly saved, if they're truly reborn, if the spirit of God dwells in them, their conscience has been quickened and made alive. And now if we sin, we, we're miserable. We don't enjoy it. We, we, we've got the law is written on our heart. A truly saved person wants to please their father, not to get forgiven, but out of gratitude that they are forgiven, you know? And so, um, yeah, that fighting, it's, no, the real fight is up here and in here. It's in our thoughts and it's in the unresolved issues. I, I like to word it this way. See, if you want to deal with demons, deal with your inner demons, <laughs> right? Deal with your inner demons, those unresolved issues or what psychologists might call the shadow, the shadow self or... Yeah. You know, right. and deal with that. And then if the evil one comes, he what what does the Bible tell us about spiritual warfare? It says, do not give any place to the devil. So he can't have a place unless I give it to him. And then it does it never tells us to go and fight the enemy, it tells us to stand. And having done all, stand. Yeah. And you know, even that verse that says resist you know draw near to god resist the devil and he will flee from you i was studying that recently mm -hmm. because you know the famous psychologist carl jung had this observation what you resist persists mm -hmm. right and that's a big subject i don't want to go into it but i i see it I, I see it in life i see it in myself that things that you resist and fight against you actually empower right mm -hmm. and so it always bothered me, this verse about draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But what you resist persists. So I decided to do a real study. And you know that I'm big on the Aramaic. Side yeah, that's right. Side. Side. Greek. So I looked it up in the Aramaic. And it says, draw near to God and stand firm against the devil. Exactly what it says in Ephesians. And having done all to stand. The idea is, in Ephesians, is a wrestling match 
we wrestle not against, but it's a wrestling match. And in the Greek wrestling match, well, you were naked, first of all, and you were covered in olive oil. You were all slippy, right? And you were to stand in a circle and your opponent was to try and get you out of your circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your job was not to fight and beat up your opponent. It was to stand in the circle and not get out of the circle. And so our spiritual warfare is to stand firm in Christ, in our redemption, in the finished work, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and not allow the enemy to get us out of that protective circle. So don't go fighting darkness, fighting the devil, fighting the enemy. I'm not saying he doesn't exist, but I'm saying most of the time I live as if he doesn't exist. And if I do feel attacked by, by the evil one or by demons or whatever, I know my job is to stand in the circle. Stand in my position in Christ. That was a real benefit of the word of faith teaching was the in Christ stuff. Mm -hmm a new creation in Christ and um, all of the in, in him verses. We have redemption in him, you know? Yeah. And, so, and so to stand firm. And honestly, I think the, the last one, I think that a lot of this stuff, the legalism, even the dualism, the futurism, comes from literalism and overly literal. So we know with futurism, people will take an overly literal interpretation even of things like that are obviously metaphorical, you know, apocalyptic visions and so on. Uh, you know, the the abyss was opened and and all of these, what were these things that flew out of them? Hornets or whatever, yeah. like crap. Yes, with the armor is a black yeah. helicopter. Oh yeah, they're black, they're helicopters or they're jet fighters because these jet fighters or these helicopters have been made and they've got that, they're painted with that colour of paint. And it's like, yeah, John was not Nostradamus. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, like, this is not, God didn't give John a vision 2,000 years ago and show him what colour of paint the United States were going to paint helicopters with in 2000. You know, it's overly literal. Yeah. This And the same with dualism. The same with dualism. So, for instance, why is it that people believe the devil is so powerful? Because there's a passage in Isaiah and there's a passage in Ezekiel that are both commonly preached that they are speaking about Satan. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, Satan was an angel and how, I don't know who Satan was. The Bible doesn't tell us who, maybe he was an angel because we know that depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, messengers, could be angels, angelos. So maybe he was, but, and demons are fallen angels, but are they? Because does it not say in Jude that the angels who sinned were bound someplace and kept in chains? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i don't think the bible really tells us exactly what demons are or really tells us exactly what the devil is but those two passages are used um how you have fallen from heaven oh lucifer it says in the king james bible which actually comes from the latin vulgate it doesn't come Oh, morning star, every other one would say. How you have fallen from heaven, oh, morning star, son of the dawn. You know, you said that you would ascend up to the, to the heavens and that you would become as great as God and all of that, but now you're cast out. Oh, this is talking about Lucifer, and Lucifer was pumped up with pride, and he fought against God, and God cast him down, and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, no, read it in context. Read it in context. And once you know a little bit about ancient Near Eastern history, you walked in Eden, the garden of God. It must be the devil, right? Okay. You read it in context and it's talking about the king of Babylon. Yeah. It says it. Bring this prophecy against the king of Babylon at the beginning. And then at the end, if you read the last verse, it said, it says, 
but you're just a mortal man and you will die like a mortal man. Okay, this is talking about the king of Babylon, who's a mortal man. This is not a supernatural being. Yeah, but what about you walked in Eden, the garden of God? What about the fact that uh, all these precious stones were your covering? What about the fact that you walked in the midst of the stones of fire? Yeah. What about the fact that you ascended to heaven in the garden of God? Well, if you know a little bit about the Babylonian kings and all the ancient Near Eastern kings, this is what you'll find out. Their palace had three parts. There was the, the king's palace. And then behind the king's palace, they had something called the Garden of the Gods. Because mm -hmm. all the ancient Near Eastern Aramaic-speaking cultures believed in the Garden of Eden story. Slightly different versions, but they all had it. Yes, and true. the Garden of the Gods was styled after it's where the persian word paradise comes from paradise a walled garden and yeah. some middle eastern islamic countries they still build these mm. and um the one of the king's duties was when he didn't know what to do was he was to go into the garden and tend the garden like a gardener mm. and they actually had they they would have uh, rivers, man-made rivers like aqueducts, four of them coming out from a central pool like the Garden of Eden yeah. and he was supposed to walk in the Garden of the Gods in his paradise his mm -hmm. walled garden, in his man-made version of Eden and he would get inspiration there about what decisions he was supposed to make also on the other side of that, they would have their temple to Baal or Dagon or whoever it was they were worshipping. And it would be a stepped pyramid, you know, a ziggurat, stepped pyramid. And they would, they would have a fire altar like the Zoroastrians had. That's the stones of fire. And the only people allowed to walk in the midst of the stones of fire were the priests and the king who walked in the midst of the stones of fire. And then at the top of this pyramid, they would have uh, a little house called the House of the God, which was like a little bedroom where they would believe that the deity would come down. And But the king would go up there. He would ascend up to the heavens and he would sit as a god in there and when the king was crowned, he would be given names like the morning star or mm. after one of the planets. You even see that in the movie, uh, the, the animated movie, um, Prince of Egypt, King of mm. Egypt. There was one about Moses, I think. You know, there's one about Joseph and one about Joseph, King of Dreams. And then there's Prince of Egypt, I think, about Moses. Yeah. And, and in that one... Pharaoh, they talk to, they say, oh, Pharaoh, you are the morning star and the evening star. Yeah. And so yeah. they would be given names like you are the cherubim of our nation. And they had cherubim carved in their temples and their palaces. You can see them at the British Museum here in London. Right? Yeah, they're, they're all over uh, uh, Turkey uh, carved in there about the Caesars, the son of God, uh, you know, That's bright, right. yeah. bright morning star. So all of a sudden you read this and you think, right, I'm not going to take this literally. I'm going to mm. take this in context. This is a prophecy to the king of Babylon who walked in the garden of the gods in his version of Eden, supposedly to get wisdom, but he was not a wise man. He's a fool who clothed himself in all of these garments embedded with jewels as if he, as if he is somebody who walked in the midst of the stones of fire worshiping pagan gods who climbed up and ascended the temple to see, and sat there saying, I am a god also, but no, king of Babylon, you're just a mortal man and you will die like every other mortal man. The end. Yeah. And all of a sudden we have taken this supernatural being language away from the devil and see seen him like the early Christian art He's just a little gnat that Michael can swat away.
yeah. with a sword, you know? And there's so many areas we do this with. Like, I think, uh, you know, this, this is such a good example. Um, there's also, uh, say, every time Jesus says Gehenna, and we forget there's a yes. literal historical trash heap outside of Jerusalem that he is referring to. Sometimes he's making the metaphor for what happens after life, but most of the time he's referring to, you're going to end up there in seven yeah, days. Yeah, and they did end up there. And they the did. The Romans invaded, killed people, and threw them, the dead people and the injured people who weren't yet dead, were cast body and soul into Gehenna into this rubbish dip over the wall and burned to death there. Yeah. The most the most detestable death for a Jew. Right. To, yeah. Yeah. It's so unclean, unclean in every unclean. way. Yeah. Yeah. And and the many different places like it talks about the rulers of this age have come to nothing or the God of this age. And it's like uh, we forget age is the age of the old covenant temple system mosaic yes. covenant that that we're talking about temple rulers we're talking about the law and these metaphors we lose track of or uh first peter talks about uh the elements being burned with fire we think periodic elements which we came up with you know 200 years ago instead of they weren't talking about that they were using the word stoicha for the law the elements of the old testament were yes. burned with fire, fire in AD 17. yeah we turn into nuclear war that's how most people read that first peter passage right. like that's no. right. yeah and but so we, we do this a lot even if the even if the devil did have that power in the past hebrews that talks about the new and better covenant also says uh, that Jesus came to put an end to him who had, past tense, who had the power of death, that is the devil. So we're in a new covenant where we are delivered from darkness and the enemy is defeated. We're in a new covenant which, uh, in which mo most of the major prophecies were fulfilled in that first generation in the work of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus, his birth was a fulfillment of prophecy. His life and ministry and message was a fulfillment of prophecy. His death, his resurrection, his ascension, his outpouring of the spirit, and then the fulfillment of his prophetic word in AD 70. All of that is the finished work of Christ. We live on the other side of that. And we live in a we live in grace. And so we are. Uh, we are free from all four of those spiritual diseases under a new and better covenant. Yes. So we're free of legalism. Uh, we're free of futurism. Instead of, instead of literalism or dualism, what would be the contrast of that? I would, I would say literalism is replaced with reading it as literature, but is right. there nothing to say that? Yes, that would be good. Maybe, maybe we need to come up with a, a word for that. But again, one of the things that's really helped me is understanding the ancient Near Eastern culture mm. and the Aramaic. You know, the or they, they, all those all those cultures spoke Aramaic. Yeah. You know, yeah. Arabic is a derivative of Aramaic, and so is Hebrew. I know that will upset the people that think that Adam and Eve spoke Hebrew and God speaks Hebrew in heaven and all that. But actually, they, they were all derivatives of Aramaic. Remember that the Israelites descended from Abraham and Abraham was an was a Syrian. Yeah, be, Ur of, from Ur of the Chaldees. Yeah. yeah. And it's, my father was a wandering Aramean. Mm. It's the beginning of one of the Jewish prayers. A wandering Aramean an Aramaic speaking person, right? And so all of those cultures shared a same, the same worldview and the same language. And they use a lot of things as metaphors that we would take literally, you know? And so let me just give you a quick example. Um, a, Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah. A pillar of salt is an Aramaic idiom for someone who dies of a stroke. 
their body goes stiff and they die of a stroke. There's mm -hmm. actually other places in the Old Testament that it says, I can't remember who, but it says some guy, he he died and became a stone, it says. Mm -hmm. I, Look up yeah. in your concordance sometime and you'll find it. And so Lot's wife turned round and saw Sodom and Gomorrah burning and took a stroke oh. and died of a stroke. Aramaic speak now no no she literally became pink himalayan salt that you could have put in a grind no she okay if you want to believe that fine but but um, <laughs> Snap a finger i'll take it with you <laughs> i mean like doesn't it make sense that she she with the shock of seeing that she took a stroke yeah and yeah. died and um and so uh, understanding a lot of the uh of that culture um, and that background uh, helps to not. So, like one other example would be, you know, the if the Lord sent a whirlwind and you know, and people died, we take that as God was sitting in heaven saying, "I'm going to create a whirlwind now, and I'm sending it to those people, and it's going to kill those people." But in Aramaic culture, what they mean is. Uh, God's presence is in everything and God set up the whole creation at the beginning to run according to certain lines mm. so if you go and build a house in Tornado Alley in Oklahoma someplace and then a tornado comes and blows your house down and people say well why did God do that well in Aramaic culture they, they, they would also have said that you know the wind belonged to God but they didn't mean that God deliberately targeted your house. Interesting. They have a different way of thinking huh. than we do. You wow. know, no, you shouldn't have built your house in a place where God has foreordained that the wind shall blow. Wow. You know? Yeah. So that's uh, a literalism. Yeah, that's literalism. Yeah. And literalism. I think... Yeah. In context, like, let's take things in context. Let's yeah. take things in context and look at the different genres of literature. And what would be another way of saying the opposite of dualism? Uh, like integration or? So I would see if you were to look this up in a dictionary or in a, if you were to look for the synonym to dual, dualism, they would tell you it's monism. Right. And this is where some of the people that are influenced by Eastern thought would get into. So monism would be that there is only one thing in the universe. And that, and so if you believe in God, then there's only God, right? Yeah. So then everything is God and everything is made of God and, and therefore that, that kind of thing. Um, but I think the opposite of dualism from a Christian and biblical perspective is Ho ho holism, holistic, holism. Mm. So mm. day and night make up one 24 hour day. Male and female make up the two become one, right? Mm. So the opposite of dualism would be um, that uh, there is, so darkness has been defeated by the light of Christ. So there is only one, so for us, there is only one power at work. Mm. is a holistic view and um, body and spirit are not opposite to each other i mean even watchman knee would make you think that your body is evil some of watchman knee stuff for, you know? sure. for sure yeah and in fact he would even make you think that your soul this is my watchman knee shelf right here <laughs> some of it would even make you think that your mind was evil too yeah, absolutely. The power of the soul and all of that stuff. Only trying to live in your spirit all the time. Your spirit. No, we are whole beings. Yeah. And God loves all of you. Yeah. Putting your little pinky, you know. He knows the hairs on your head. Or in your case, it's not that hard to work out. But... <laughs> all of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he knows how many hairs are on your head and all of that stuff. So, so a holistic, I think a holistic viewpoint would be the opposite for that oh that's wonderful that's wonderful and and in your breaking out of these things and moving forward in ministry what's the difference when you see somebody embrace 
living outside of the four diseases and living in the four healthy realms. There, there is a sense of advancement in their life now, rather than a sense of containment. There's a sense of, um, before that, there's like, I'm never good enough. My faith is never strong enough. I'm not holy enough. I don't pray enough. I'm defeated by the enemy too much. I'm not living, you know, all of that kind of thing. I don't understand the Bible enough, and you know, it, it, every all of that. So there, there, I think faith then becomes much more of a journey. Whereas before that, it's a destiny. It's like I, I need to, I need to get everything fixed. I need to defeat the enemy. I need to learn everything and all my doctrines and get them all down. And now I finally arrived. When I finally arrived. No, it's now a journey and there's a sense of advancement. I am growing in my relationship with God. My view of the world is expanding. The path of the righteous is like the noonday sun. It gets brighter and brighter, you know? And I think that sense of advancing, of a journey that is advancing, you know, yeah, there might be times for short periods, not for my whole life, but there might be short periods that I go through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. But even then I will fear no evil for you are with me and you're leading me out of it to a banquet. Mm. You know? Mm. So there's a sense of advancement in life. Sense of advancement. Now that that is that is so even there is better fruit. I mean, you look at the vine. That, that it produces more, it's pruned, and then much more. And then you have 30, 60, 100 fold. Like we have these options of how much fruit yeah. do we want to have in our life? Do we want to double the talents or just bury them in the ground? And, 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 you, could, and, and you can embrace all of life now. It's not like that's the devil's territory and that's God. Yeah. You can enjoy God's presence as much sitting on a beach, sipping a pina colada, as you can even in a worship service or in a Bible seminar. God is part of, life is holistic. And so you, God, you, don't have to, you don't have to feel guilty if you actually enjoy this planet and know that you're a son or daughter? That's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's good. And Martin, uh, what we've talked about today is in your book, Eyes Wide Shut, right? Eyes Wide Open. I, I know- I Eyes Wide Shut is a naughty movie. <laughs> I, I've never heard of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, took the, I actually took the title from the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Because in the movie Eyes Wide Shut, it's like, uh, it's a conspiracy theory movie. There are scenes in it that are not appropriate for Christian viewing, so I'm not recommending it. And it's, yeah. and it's about the demonic and secret societies and, and and the stuff they got up to and it's like his eyes are opened his eyes have been shut to this his whole life and now that he's seen it his eyes are open and he sees it everywhere and so i used that metaphor and thought when your eyes are opened to these truths that we're under that this is a we're not living in that age that age is over we're in a we're in another age and in fact the we don't have time to get into this, but there are many ages. There's not just two. There's former ages. In former ages, God spoke to us through many prophets, but in these last days of that age, he spoke to us through the Son. And in the ages to come, he might show us the supremacy of Christ. So there's, and the ages are advancing, Mm. right? And so, and our lives are advancing. And so when your eyes are open that we don't live in that old covenant age, but we're in this new and better covenant and that that we need to understand that the Bible was written to a particular group of people who had a particular culture using their particular language and metaphors. And we respect the literature of it and we seem to understand it. All of a sudden your eyes are open and you see I feel like I've been born again all over again, <laughs> you know? So like, I'd Wise oh, Open is your book where you cover the four that we talked about today. Yes. In depth. But have you written on the ages yet? The same book. So, same book. so it, it's, it kind of, so it, it feels like two different books. Eyes mm-hmm. Wide Open has three sections. The first section deals with the four spiritual diseases. Okay. Then it looks like I go on a rabbit trail, and in section two, I talk about the ages. 
I talk about the old covenant age and the new covenant, Matthew 24, the book of Revelation, but I also talk about the ancient Near Eastern calendar system and how they, how they understood an age. They knew that their age was coming to an end and that the Messiah was coming. Mm. Not only did the Jews know that, but even the Magi, who were part of the ancient Near Eastern culture, knew the Messiah was coming yeah. and the age was coming to an end. And they got that through their calendar system yeah. of watching the movement of the stars. Um, so I talk about that and then how we're in a new age, a new covenant age, and how the, the ages are advancing and and um, and the kingdom is advancing too. And then in the third section, I kind of bring both of those things together and say, right, in the light of the fact that we're in a new age and there's more ages to come and God's kingdom will advance, and, and that we're free from these four spiritual diseases, how then do we live? So I address things like people want to be spiritual, but not religious, right? How can you apply that in a Christian context without going weird, right? Yeah. Um, how can you deconstruct the toxic elements like legalism and so on without deconstructing your faith and losing your faith, still being true to scripture? But to what scripture really teaches, not what you thought it taught before, right? Yeah. yeah. So that kind of thing. So that's all in the book, Eyes Wide Open. Wow. Yeah, oh, man. And I've got, I'm actually got an online course coming out on that soon um, yeah. on martintrench.com. There will be an online course where if, if people don't have the book, as part of the course, they will get a PDF version of the book. They will get a workbook and a uh, Loads of stuff in that workbook about the ancient Near Eastern culture and Aramaic and and some of the things like Lot's wife and the Pillar of Saul, all of that in there, quotes from other people in the workbook. And there's a set of, I think it's, I think it's eight videos, sessions on that. And then people can interact with me if they have questions and so on too. So these courses are going to be available on martintrench.com. Correct. Okay. Wonderful. If, if there, when this podcast comes out, if they're not there yet, it will be a matter of weeks. Okay. That. Okay. Wonderful. Well, everybody, I highly recommend anything Martin says or does. I love Martin, and I, I'm sure you've had a great time uh, listening to him as well today. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to thank us. You. And thank you, Martin, for being with everybody today. And, uh, with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. But thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.